Hey Bayek, it's me and, and in today's video I'm going to look at this. Yes, it is Lust for a Vampire from 1971. And yes, what a film this is. It's perhaps one of Hammer's most notorious films because, well, it had a very troubled um, production um it is often seen um as perhaps the weakest and even some may say the worst hammer film however i think i'll show you that it may well have some of those attributes but that's also good in this film as well um and um let's get into it then um well, it's 95 minutes long, so it's the usual sort of standard Hammer film time. Uh, we've got, if you look on Rotten Tomatoes, 20%. <laughs> I think that reflects often a general opinion. Some might say, hey, even that's too blooming high, I'll tell they hit 20%. But hey, critics, you know, they had a field day, I think it's fair to say with this film. So, you're saying to yourself, um, why is all this fuss? Well, let's just look at some of the background to this film. It is, in fact, a direct sequel and part of the trilogy of the Kleinstein trilogy, as it's known as. So, you have um, The Vampire Lovers, which starred in Good Pit. Then you've got this one, uh, Lust for a Vampire. And then um, you've got The Twins of Evil. Uh, that's in 1971, Twins of Evil. This is all part of the trilogy. And it represents Hammer in a bit of turmoil. And the introduction of Style and Fine as producers who wanted to take Hammer into a very different direction from what it was known. They wanted to bring Hammer right into the, um, what they saw as the revolution that was happening in terms of making films more gory, more uh, sexually explicit. And the censorship uh, rules had changed X certificates were now 18. So they felt there was a slight, um, well, not a slight, but a, a loosening of censorship and certain, in sexual terms, they could be more explicit. This was their um, way of looking at it. So in reality, if you look at it, though they may have been a relaxation, and you can see it in this film, it's not always dramatic, and s films did run into still per in these periods um, censorship problems. Um, it was a gradual process, um, and um, though we're opening the doors to more explicit uh, portrayals, it is a gradual process. But this film decided to really let itself know, um, though. Um, when you look at it now, it may seem relatively tame, but at the time, it was, it was a bit controversial, I would say. Um, the other films, uh, independent films as well, were looking at more, being more explicit in terms of violence and sex. I mean, this film, its background is quite troubled, really, because... Um, Jimmy Sangster, who um, directed this, was brought in right, well, a week before production began. So it wasn't really um, a good start. Terence Fisher, um, I think, had, I think he broke his leg or something like that. He was due to usual early, um, direct this film. Um, and of course, I think with Terence Fisher, um, 
the film may well have been a different style. Um, some people can see the difference. They see the quality, they think, in this film. But I don't think it's Jimmy Sangster's uh, fault at all. Uh, it's He was getting interference from the new producers, Stan Fine. They were basically saying, we want this, we want this, this is how it should be. The script was an interesting point as well. You see, the script, original title, um, it was a love for a vampire. And it's a totally different script. This is this is what makes it interesting. It was a, it, it when I say totally different, the story is very much the same. But it's got a more romantic outlook it the lead um is seen in a more romantic way the relationship with the vampire it's not um like this film turns out this film is looking for more the erotic sexual angle but there are hints in this film from that original script um which uh, show that um, they it did have this romantic thing. And now the film, I think, would have been very different in tone. I think Terence Fisher probably was looking more for that because he had a tradition with the way he directed in his films. So, um, though I'm sure he might have had some of the pressures but um, that we have from the new uh, producers who were definitely looking for this more sexual explicitness. I mean, as soon as the film starts, it's all there. You know, you within a few minutes, he's obviously making itself uh, known of what it's going to do. And uh, you think, oh, um, yes, that wouldn't have happened in the olden days. Perhaps straight away... Um, these girls, it wouldn't have happened quite like that. And this is there saying, now look, here we are. Um, as we know, this uh, is really a sequel um, from the first film, um, you know, from the uh, Camilla novels. Um, this continues, The Lesbian Vampire, um, theme, which Ingrid Pitt played so well. But you look at the difference now. Again, you, there's a bit of controversy here because she didn't want the role. It was offered to her and she didn't want it. Um, maybe she knew how things were going to be, um, but she wasn't doing other... She had other work commitments, I think, as well. Um, so she wasn't really um it was probably a good thing for her from her career viewpoint that she didn't get involved in this film um so they got a replacement now the replacement is a danish actress called uh elita stangard stansgard yeah now she played a character uh miracala um they changed the name but it in we can see it's actually as, as revealed in the film she's Camilla um, um, as we see so brilliantly actually the, the that um, scene at the beginning looks at first more like classic uh, Hammer with a resurrection the brilliant drama involved um, it's fantastic now, I think one of the downsides is the portrayal of um, I suppose um, the Count Karnstein he's uh, played by Mike Raven um, who was I think it was, he was a DJ or something and um, it's the role is very funny he's almost trying to be like Christopher Lee even and he, I, the acting is I think quite funny and some of the lines in the scripts which were changed with him and he's there staring away and then one minute he's there suddenly oh he's a doctor and of course what's he going to say the deaths he suddenly you know just happens to be a doctor and saying uh what has caused death heart attack and then 
A bit later, another one happens, and I say, what's the cause of the death? Heart attack. You know, he's about as convincing as a doctor. He's you know, just, just not convincing at all. Uh, it, it's part of the problems of some of the script um, have we got already in this. Um, now, the actor um, who would have been the lead would have been Peter Cushion. But unfortunately, um, his wife was seriously ill um, and he had to go and look after her. So he dropped out pretty quick. Now, um, his replacement was Ralph Bates. Ralph Bates um, was friends with Jimmy Sangster. Um, he'd been cast in the... Um, um, Frankenstein film, which had produ been produced that year. Um, and then it was brought into this. Um, I remember, of course, um, in Ralph Bates also, in the um, Taste the Blood of Dracula, where he played Lord Courtney. Um, but he's a good, so solid actor. Um, and he... He's now said that he wasn't particularly happy with the film. But, as everybody's said, he gives a good performance considering what he's got. There's almost that feeling that he was brought in and, you know, he's got to try and live up to the great Peter Cushion. And, you know, that can't be um, an easy thing to do, but he's a very professional actor. But his character is a bit sort of strange. It's almost like a... Uh, almost as a bit of comic element. But yeah, he's, he's quite a sort of... Um, well, he wants to be um, more... I don't know if you want to call it evil than he seems. He wants to follow uh, the Camilla. He's, he's the one who... He's a teacher at this finishing school. I love the way they have that, the finishing school for these uh, girls. It's an excuse, basically, to show all these women. Um, and it this is so funny about the film. You know, there's always an excuse within the film. Um, and that's it. Um, so he's involved in it. And then uh, we've got, not for a very long scenes, but we've got Barbara Jefford, who plays... The Countess, and actually she gives a very good performance, considering, and it's not much, in really, in relative terms, she pops up. Um, then we've got, I suppose, you see, I said um, Ralph Bates was the lead. I suppose the lead was actually played um, Michael Johnson playing Richard Lestrange. Now, he should have been... I suppose, more the romantic lead originally in the script. But um, he doesn't... I don't think... I'm not sure whether his acting quite hits the point with it. It's, It could be, again, problems with the script or what have you. But as the lead actor, I don't think he's always as convincing. I'm sounding all negative here about the film. I'm just going to give you... I'm trying to give these before we go into the more positive sides because I always give positive sides. And, you know, it's another reason why I still enjoy Hammer films. And you have to be honest and look at the problems of why a film is seen to be perhaps the worst or weakest Hammer film going. You have to look at that. It's... Um, it's reality, uh, but um, that these are the problems uh, that I'm showing. Um, also, if we look at the background of Hammer now, um, it's it's an important time because they've lost the American money. They're having to look around for more ways of getting money in, for, in the productions, um, and they were fortunate that EMI were able to be involved and produce the finance for this as in, as in a deal. Um, so that is another factor going on. 
And I, I think they kind of hoped that by this style they would make a killing at the box office and, um, get, you know, um, move their company and production team into this new era. And these two, uh, style and fine, were the ones to do it. But of course, ultimately, they weren't. I mean, they only did, um, I think, three films. Um, and they were gone. <laughs> there was a change because it was acknowledged that it hadn't worked. You, they, they tried, if you want, to bring that sort of um, erotic um, look, but in a very more titillating way. If <laughs> that's a sort of way, there was there wasn't as much class to it. Though I can argue that Jimmy Sangster does try his best to add something to the, this film and the um in his direction but of course they started to interfere and uh, and the editing um they interfered in in fact when Jimmy Sangster saw the film I don't think he was too pleased because it wasn't the film he believed he'd produced they'd been interfering and in the way it was um there's a dream sequence. Now, I think the dream sequence is actually done in quite an interesting way. It's almost, it's got the erotic side, but it's almost trying to show that there's a romantic side as well. And the conflict between the vampire and the human um, love, if you want, relationship. Though, you know, it's quite funny how he suddenly falls in love with this um, girl who he's hardly just seen. It's like love at first sight kind of thing, but it's quite a funny thing. But what makes this interesting is that this... Also, there was a song played in this sequence called um, Strange Love by a teenage um, girl called Tracy which was released as a, um, a B-side on a single. And this music, now, I know it sounds funny, but I can see where the actual pop song music is coming from. I think, because you, sometimes you get in sometimes, I, I'm thinking, I'm, maybe it's me, maybe it's me, but I've seen these, like, French kind of um, sort of romantic, erotic films where the music, it's like a love story, part of that. And I think that's what this was trying to do in a strange way. And it adds the atmosphere to it. Um, and um, I think it's interesting. It is very interesting, that sequence, um, in context of the film. Um, the film is beautifully filmed in some places. The locations, again, that are used... Um, just wonderful, you know, and it's Hammer again. There's that still legacy of Hammer, and Jimmy Sangster is able to do this of making, you know, I'm not having much money on a low budget, um, producing beautiful scenes and that. I mean, Terence Fisher was the expert at it, but I don't think we should not this. I think it does in places look absolutely beautiful to look at. Um, um, as I say, it, it's there are major failures in this film, but I, it's still entertaining. You can watch this film and be entertained by it. And, um, you know, there's all the usual hammer cliches, like at the end, you know, with the big fire and all that kind of stuff. But I think the, the character that makes me laugh unintentionally is this Mike Raven playing Count Karnstein. He just pops up and I just... I just find it so funny. I don't know why. I, you know, this is what you have to take this film. Just be entertained by it. But except that perhaps it isn't the greatest film going. But you can enjoy it in that sense. Um, and I certainly did enjoy this. Um, it's it's really pleasing in the sense that you're thinking, how did they get away with this? Because if you look at The Twins of Evil... Um, the third film and I think Twins of Evil is probably the best 
of the films. Peter Cushion is back in Twins of Evil. And I've reviewed it, um, I think, um, a while ago. But um, it, the Twins of Evil is such a, a different film from this, if you look at it. Much more a better film, you could say, the way it is. Um, and I think um, The Vampire Lovers is definitely a better film than this because um, Ingrid Pitt, I think, adds a better, I think, feel to the character and the more predatory nature of uh, Camille. I think that works so much better. And she's a, a bit more older actress than the lead here. I think Ingrid Pitt really puts that film well. This, sadly, is lacking that. And um, I think that is a major problem for the film. But, hey, I think you could still enjoy this. And it, it's an enjoyable part of Hammer history to have. And I'm happy to watch it again. Of you, you know, it's it's something I'm happy to have in the collection, and it's great. You know, um, this. Uh, let me just quickly. We've got a more slip cover action. The, these series of films were issued. This was actually uh, in 2019 issued. Um, there's um, a DVD as well in it, which you don't get as much nowadays. Um, so it's a double disc set and the documentary on here is spot on. Absolutely love the, the documentary. Um, I think that's all I can really say about this uh, now. Um, um, it is an enjoyable film, as I say. And there we are. So um, subscribe if you want to know more when I um, produce these videos. Um, also, if you like this, give it a like. That would be fantastic if you did. It, it costs no, as I always say. And um, all I'm going to say is, I'll see thee. I'll see thee again. <laughs>